Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. Violet Muller. In this episode, we're travelling back to 15th century Florence, the very epicentre of the Renaissance. In February 1434, a young boy made his way over the Ponte Vecchio, the bridge that spans the River Arno in Florence. Weaving a path through the jostling crowds of people, he walked up the Via dei Libri, the street of the booksellers, and arrived at the door of Michele Guaducci's shop. It was his first day of work. His name was Vespasiano da Bisticci, and he went on to become one of the most powerful and well-connected people in 15th century Italy, one of the great movers and shakers of the Renaissance, a bookseller, an intelligence gatherer, a writer, but above all, a bibliophile in the last great age of the manuscript. He met all the great scholars of the day, and many of them saw his potential and helped him to forge a career as a manuscript specialist. Our expert tour guide on this journey is the Renaissance specialist Ross King, who has written several best-selling books on the history of art and culture. He has spent the previous four years writing The Bookseller of Florence, Vespasiano da Bisticci, and the manuscripts that illuminated the Renaissance bringing to life the incredible story of the man at the heart of Florentine culture. Ross King is a renowned expert in the Italian Renaissance. He is the author of numerous best-selling and acclaimed books, including Brunelleschi's Dome, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, Leonardo and the Last Supper, and Mad Enchantment, Claude Monet and the Painting of the Water Lilies. His love of Renaissance Florence, which he has been studying, writing and lecturing about for over 20 years, made Vespasiano's long-forgotten story an irresistible next subject. So I'd like to start by welcoming you, Ross, um, to travel Through Time. Thank you very much for taking the time to come on. I read in the beginning of your book, you say that you spent four years uh, researching it. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit about um, how that re- research happened and, and where you went to do it. Yes, it was a long four years, a very pleasurable four years of doing research, um, both in Oxford, Uh, in London, at the London Library, and also at places like the State Archives in Florence and the National Library in Florence, uh, looking at the documents. Um, It's probably the book that, of all of my books, it's the one that has taken the greatest amount of time uh, because of the fact that I was, traditionally I look at five, six, seven, 10, 12 years in the life of a particular person. Uh, But in this case, I'm looking at at about five decades from very quite in depth from the 1430s until the 1480s, early 1490s in Florence. Um, And so it's much more panoramic. There are also quite a few deep dives within that. And so it was really an attempt to uh, write quite expansively across the decades with a cast of quite a few characters, uh, uh, both fairly humble guys like my hero Vespasiano, uh, but also with exalted figures, not just the Medici in Florence, but also um, people like you know, two of the kings of Naples who reigned during that time, the Duke of Urbino, the uh, a couple of popes as well, um, who were very closely linked with intellectuals in Florence. And so it was really trying to harness all of this information and then put it into, crucially, put it into a narrative form. And was it something that you'd been thinking about writing for a while? I mean, you know, many of your books are about Renaissance art. Um, Not all of them, of course. You wrote a book about Monet as well, I know. Um, And so is this something that you've been, a project that you've been kind of thinking about for many years or or not? Very much so, probably for about 20 years. Uh, But the thing is, I wanted to find my character. 
my books are character driven. There's always a kind of central figure, often a very strong charismatic figure, such as Michelangelo, for example, or Monet in the, the Monet book. Um, and so I wanted to write about manuscript and print culture in the 1400s and the recovery of knowledge, which really kick-started the Renaissance. I wanted to look at, um, at this kind of transformation, this pivot point in history and in Western culture. Uh, but I didn't just want to do so kind of looking at the abstract ideas um, and with a, a changeable cast of characters. I wanted to find someone who would give me the continuity to tell the story. And that's what Vespasiano did. Um, he was someone who united the entire story, partly because, or mostly because he was at the, the center of it as the, this great merchant of knowledge. But secondly, then, because of the fact that he was at the center, he knew so many people and had insight into their lives. He knew various popes, he knew all of the, the Medici. And so, you know, I had my eureka moment four or five years ago when I began reading his, you know, what is effectively a kind of autobiography that he wrote, which is a series of biographies of his illustrious contemporaries. Um, and as I read that, I realized uh, that he was the he was the one I could use. He was the guy who would bring this story together. So he is a major source him, himself. His own writings are a major source for this period. Absolutely. He I mean, he's one of the best sources for 15th century history because of the fact that he had this front row seat and because of the fact that he was involved uh, in a lot of the politicking of the time. He wasn't just someone um, who, who sold books, which was obviously his day job. But as I described, he also worked in espionage and his shop essentially became, his bookshop became a kind of listening post or a, a kind of headquarters of various spy networks with Vespasiano really at the center of it, like the spider in the web, drawing in information through his alliances and through his personal relationships at that time. Wonderful. Um, and so I think now I'd like to ask you um, the question we ask all our guests, which is, of course, if you could travel back in time, Ross, which year would you choose? It would be the year 1434. OK, and I know that well, obviously we will be going to Florence because that, that is where your book is set. So can you just tell us a bit about Florence uh, in this period? What's happening? What, what's the city like? Um, I think my biggest question is why why was it that Florence became such a magnet for these learned people and and indeed for manuscripts and and learning of all kinds? Yes, yes. I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon, and there's no obviously, as with all big questions like that or questions that are um, require complex answers, there are a lot of reasons for it. I'll try to give the main reason in a minute, but I'll just say about Florence that, it, in 1434, had a population at most of about 40,000 people. So it was quite a small town. You could walk, as you still can today, you can walk from the um, northern gateway or the northwest gateway to the southern gateway, depending on stopping at traffic lights and making your way through crocodiles of tourists, you can do it in about 45 minutes. So that's one of the crucial things. It's a smallish population in a fa fairly restricted area. So everyone gets to know everyone else. And there are not rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods. The rich live cheek by jowl with the poor. But I would say maybe the crucial answer to your question of why Florence became this, uh, this magnet for learning was, I mean, a crucial date in history. And when I thought about talking about was 1397, uh, so a generation or so before the time I'm talking about. And on February the 2nd, 1397, someone came from Constantinople to Florence to teach Greek at their local university, uh, the Studio Fiorentino. His name was Manuel Chrysolorus, um, and he was a Byzantine aristocrat who had originally come to the West in the 1390s to recruit you know, to inspire Christian leaders to go off on a, a crusade to protect Constantinople, which was being encircled by the Ottoman Turks. And the Florentines were not remotely interested in a crusade. 
but a light bulb went off in their heads and they said, this man can teach us how to speak Greek. And so they offered him a post, which he occupied for three years uh, before moving on, albeit staying in Italy, and he taught Greek. Um, it's not true that no one in Italy could speak Greek in the Middle Ages, uh, because there were Greek communities, bazillion monasteries in the south of Italy where the liturgy was performed in Greek. Nevertheless, no one had the Greek necessary, uh, the sort of facility and aptitude to, to read Homer, for example, in the original Greek, or to read Plato, or to read Aristotle in the original Greek. And Chrysoloris, this Byzantine aristocrat, taught a generation of Florentines who then taught the next generation, not just of Florentines, but Italians. And so that is the reason uh, why, if you have a Greek manuscript that you found in Constantinople or Sicily or somewhere like that, you know that there's going to be a market for it in Florence because the Florin there are Florentine collectors there. There's a man named Niccolo Niccoli um, who has the largest private collection in Europe of 800 manuscripts. And if you fetch up in Florence with a, a Greek manuscript or even a Latin manuscript that is relatively unknown, Nicoli will take it off your hands. And can you just put can you just put his collection in context? Because today, eight hundred books doesn't sound like an awful lot, but at the time, just give us some. Yes, the, probably the largest library in Europe uh, in the early fourteen hundreds belonged to the kings of France, but it was broken up. Um, and scattered. It was probably over a thousand. Uh, but at this time, the average monastery had less than a hundred. Some cardinals uh, might have had 50, 60, 70. Cosimo de' Medici, who we'll come to in a few minutes, uh, was a great book collector. And yet he just had, as far as we know, uh, 70 books. Okay. And this is the city into which this um, young boy, Vespasiano, comes he's not born there is he so can you take us to uh the first our first scene and tell us what's happening well let's imagine a, a boy crossing the river uh, crossing the ponte vecchio because his family at this point he's a fatherless child i mean he's 11 possibly 11 at the oldest 12 we're not in exactly sure when he was born it appears to have been uh, 1422. So he's probably in early 1434 when he first appears in the documents as a boy assistant. He's 11 years old. And he crosses the Arno, probably in the Ponte Vecchio, and begins walking north uh, about 10 minutes from his family home where he has five siblings um, and going to work in the Via dei Librai, the street of booksellers. Um, which is today's Via del Proconsolo, which anyone who's been to Florence has probably walked down it because that is where the Bargello is, which meant that's where you went to buy not only books, i.e. manuscripts, but also paper and parchment, writing supplies, ink, things like that. I mean, so Vespasiano, at the age of 11, after probably five or six years of schooling, was apprenticed out, sent off to work, to earn his crust, earn his crust for his family, uh, he obviously loved books because he was put to work in the shop of a man named Michele Guarducci, who had his little shop on the corner right beside the Bargello, uh, which was the palace of the senior magistrate in Florence. Think police captain slash chief justice, something like that. Very important building, very imposing building. Um, and he is he's recorded as the boy assistant in February 1434. And his job probably would have been maybe just helping out as a kind of dog's body. Um, and ultimately, because Michele, although he sold books, was primarily a book binder. I'm sure Vespasiano would have, you know, have had to take his hammer and and begin stitching up books with a needle and then hammer, hammering the book together. And this very physical labor that book book binding required. And can you tell us a bit about, because they were bookshops, as you said, and, and you know places that you went to buy supplies for writing, but they were also meeting places, weren't they? And, and places where intellectuals gathered and talked and had conversations. And can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. That's uh, one of the things that 
I think made Florence special in some ways is that people gathered together in specific locations to discuss philosophical topics, probably also artistic topics and things like that. I'm sure they gossiped and spoke nonsense as well, uh, but there seems to have been a high level of debate in Florence. And in fact, one of the people who became a very good friend and a kind of mentor of Vespasiano, a man named Genozzo Manetti, a great humanist scholar, perfected his Latin by listening to debates in the what is now the Piazza della Signoria in Florence. Um, and so there was this kind of high level of debate, in some cases actually in Latin, carried on. And one of the places, um, it's not clear how long before 1434, but certainly beginning in 1434 or soon afterwards, one of the prime places to discuss philosophy was uh, what in the Tuscan dialect was described as Sul Canto del Palagio, outside, beside the palace, beside the Bargello, which meant directly in front of Guarducci's shop, where Vespasiano went to work. So these scholars uh, would gather and begin discussing outside. And they would also, of course, I mean, I'm sure one of the reasons they assembled there was because of the fact they would have gone into the shop to look for books because Michele Guarducci sold humanist writings. He sold the works of Cicero, if he had them, um, works of the a ancient Latin authors, etc., who had piqued the interest, obviously, of uh, many of these humanist scholars and philosophers in Florence. And of course, he was, as you said, you know, wasn't from a particularly wealthy family and wasn't able to continue his education um, beyond 11 years old. But this kind of was a, almost like a democratization of education, wasn't it? Because they were just out in the square. Presumably anyone who was interested could come and listen and join in. And, and I think that's that, that's a very interesting aspect of it, because, you know, at this point, education was so... Uh, limited, and there were so few people who were get, had the benefit of education. And of course, you know, then you get these very talented, intelligent young men like Vespasiano, who had the opportunity to have a career that they would never normally have been able to. Yes. And it, I mean, another important thing to note related to that is Florence's university. It was not one of the great universities of Europe. It was not Paris, Oxford, Bologna, Padua, anything like that. It was very small. Um, it was founded early uh, uh, in the 14th century, and, and for part of the a couple of decades of the 14th century, it had a single professor. But crucially, one of the things that it did was gave public lectures, and the professors of Greek would give public lectures in the lingua fiorentina, in the, the vulgar tongue, which was then accessible to the people. And Vespasiano, very intriguingly, describes being present at uh, one of the lectures given in the early 1430s, when he was still a child, he hadn't even gone to work in the bookshop at this point. He describes hearing Carlo Marsupini, who was a, a great scholar originally from Arezzo, who was a professor at the studio, um, gave a lecture in which he quoted from every known Greek and Roman author. So it was this uh, jaw-dropping piece of erudition. And anyone could turn up. They were held in the cathedral uh, anyone could turn up and listen uh, to these discussions. And you're right, Vespasiano, that was his education. In some ways, his education took place quite literally in the street, in the piazza, on the street corner outside of the bookshop, uh, because he probably, as I said, went to school for only five or six years. But clearly, within the space of a decade or so, he became an authority on authors and on the manuscripts of authors such as Plato. Um, and so um, he uh, clearly was paying close attention to the gossip outside the shop. And crucially also, um, he was almost earmarked, or he was a, a brand plucked from the fire by a number of these scholars, uh, a great ecclesiastic, uh, Cardinal Cesarini, well, one of the most impressive figures in the Roman Catholic Church, a great scholar, and Ambassador Cesarini took him under his wing and wanted to make a priest out of him, but Vespasiano said, no thanks. Um, but also Niccolo Niccoli, who we've mentioned, 
having this wonderful collection of books, invited Vespasiano to his home for dinners and made books available to him. And he held, didn't he hold sessions in his library for young men to come and read the text and then talk? talk. It was very clever of them. I mean, that's what must have been a big contributing factor into making Florence into this great centre of learning, because you're basically just spreading the learning out, passing it on to the next generation. Well, it was like book groups. I, I think the yeah, way that, sounds wonderful. Uh, oh. <laughs> Niccolo Nicoli is he was the host for a book group and you would be invited to his house, which was one of the most beautiful houses in Florence. He was very independently wealthy and hand you a book or you could choose a book. And then you would sit and read quietly as eight, 10, 12 others were sitting reading quietly with books of their own. Um, and then you would put your book aside and a discussion would begin. Um, and so there was this great, wonderful intellectual life in Florence at this time. And Vespasiano was the beneficiary of it. Yeah. And of course, books were incredibly expensive at that point and precious. So this this really was important because these boys were otherwise probably wouldn't have been able to access certainly not many books. The lovely things about Nicoli is that he, uh, I mean, in some ways, as I described, he was a terrible, irascible character um, who made who made enemies very easily. But he was incredibly generous if you wanted to learn. And of his 800 manuscripts, I mean, you might go to him and ask him for one of his manuscripts and he would say, oh, I'm sorry, that is out on loan to a monk uh, in Lucca or that is out on loan to a friend of mine down the street. Because at any given point, he seems to have had something like one half to quarter of his books out on loan. And certainly when he died in 1437, many of them were had been dispersed into, I mean, anyone who's loaned a book. Yeah, knows, they don't get returned every time. <laughs> merges with the collection of the person to whom you have lent it. Oh, wonderful. So that gives us a really gr vivid picture of what it would have been like um, in Florence in the um, 1430s. So I think now we can move on to our next scene, which is slightly later on in the year. Um, can you tell us where we are and what's happening? Sure. It's, uh, it's June of 1434. So it's a few months after Vespasiano is known to have started work. Um, and let me begin this bit of the story uh, a, a week or so earlier in Rome where the Pope, Eugenius IV, who is a Venetian Pope, um, uh, realizes that things are getting too hot in Rome. The people are revolting. The people are rebelling. The anti-papal feelings are being whipped up by the Colonna family. Um, I mean, the Popes had just been back in uh, Rome for a very short period of time. And the Roman people, who had a strong Republican tradition, did not like the fact that a foreigner, a Venetian, for example, could come into their midst and have powers of taxation and legislation over them. Didn't matter that he was the Pope. They didn't like this. Um, and especially, I mean, the people who most especially did not like it were the Roman barons, these ancient feudal families who were at war with one another for much of the time. Uh, families like the Colonna, the Orsini, the Frangipani, etc. They were, they were at war with each other, but then would often unite together against the Pope. And it was the misfortune of the Venetian Eugenius uh, to take over from a, a man who was a Roman and who came from the Colonna family, Pope Martin V, who'd been elected in 1417, died in 1431. And so it's a kind of invidious position for Eugenius to come into because of the fact that the um, the, the Colonna family, upon whom uh, you know, these are his uh, relatives, upon whom Martin showered all sorts of benefits, now need to be taken back by Eugenius. So the Colonna were opposed to him and began fomenting rebellion among the people. And things got so dire uh, that uh, by the early months of 1434, Eugenius decided that he was going to have to either get some sort of an army together or flee. And he chose the latter. He fled uh, in disguise. So he left uh, the Vatican palace disguised as a monk, got into a boat and darted down the Tiber. Uh, but people on the Tiber's <laughs> banks noticed a monk with an escort of four crossbowmen and thought this looks very highly suspicious. They realized it was the Pope. He was a, a very tall unmistakable, very charismatic figure. They recognized him 
um, and st so started shooting arrows at him, pelting him with stones. He had to hide under a shield. And this 15 mile chase then ensues. Oh my goodness. And um, the people of Rome go after him and try to catch him. But he ultimately got to Ostia on the coast, the, um, the, the little seaport, and there was a boat waiting for him, a uh, rescue uh, boat. Was there no sense that he was the anointed pope and that, you know, shooting arrows at him was perhaps not a good idea? Well, one of, one of the problems he had... No, I, I don't think that occurred to anyone, no. But, I mean, the, the papacy was at a low ebb at this point yeah, because of the fact that we had just come out of this period of, first of all, the, you know, what was called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy, where between 1309 and 76, 1309 and 1376, the papacy was not in Rome. It was in Avignon. Mm. In 1309, the pope, who was French, left for the friendlier environs of Avignon. Um, and then uh, ultimately when the Pope moved back to Rome in 1476, a schism developed because he became unpopular with the French um, who elected their own Pope. And so we had the anti-Pope, the, these two Popes both claiming to be the, the Lord's anointed. Weren't there even three Popes at one point? So I mean, what happened in 1409, they called the Council in Pisa. They said, we need to sort the situation out and decide who is going to be Pope. And so in Pisa, they in 1410, a year later, they elected someone, but the other two reigning popes, so-called popes, refused to resign. So there were three of them. Between 1410 and 1417, there were three popes. So the Lord's anointed is a kind of, I don't know, movable feast or something at this point. It's right. something that doesn't have the the hallow and grandeur uh, that maybe it did before and since. So I think people did not think twice about um, unleashing an arrow at the Pope. And I think there's no question the Colonna um, would, they probably wouldn't have killed Eugenius had they caught him, but they would have imprisoned him. And I think Eugenius's other problem, which I won't go into, was a another council, the Council of Basel, which met and was trying to depose him. And, that, and so in some ways, people regarded him as not the legitimate pope. Um, I mean, that okay. was a convenient excuse for the, the, <clears throat> the Romans who wanted rid of him to say that he's someone that we can um, uh, get rid of because there's another legitimate pope that we're going to elect in Basel. Um, and so, yes, there was no problem whatsoever with attacking a pope at this time, or indeed for uh, decades afterwards, the papacy lived uneasily um, with the Roman barons and the Roman people, and often with neighbors. Um, I mean, Florence at one point went to war with Pope at the end of the 1470s against yeah. Pope Sixtus IV, etc. Okay, but so Eugenius makes it to Ostia and then presumably gets in a boat, sails north up the coast of Italy to Pisa or somewhere. Um, and then sets off in a kind of triumphal procession uh, to Florence, where he's going to take refuge. And uh, he is not the first pope to make Florence his headquarters because his predecessor, Martin V, the Roman pope, the uh, Odoni Colonna, which was his original name, um, he had in 1420 stayed in Florence for most of that year. He okay. ultimately was going to go back to Rome, uh, but Rome was in such a, a terrible state in 1420 that he decided he would wait in Florence in the greater safety and comfort while he was prepared well, lodgings, etc., were prepared for him. Um, and so it was maybe natural in some ways for Eugenius to go to Florence. But he, one of the, I'm sure, deciding factors was that his banker was in Florence. And that's, of course, oh, right. what it made him and so, Yeah. So he moves into Santa Maria Novella. Is that right? The monastery. Into right? the Dominican Basilica, takes his lodgings there. Um, and there's this spectacular procession as he enters the city, because the Pope is coming to, to Florence. The Pope has not been in Florence for now 14 years, more than a dozen years. And so it's a big event. And there is a document describing how all of the great families are going to go out and meet him, and they're going to escort him into town. And so he gets, even though he's been deposed, he's a homeless fugitive. He's a refugee. Um, he's given this wonderful welcome um, in Florence. And one of the people who clearly stood on the roadside and watched him come into Florence. It was Vespasiano who gives us this great description of it. 
And so, yes, he goes into the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella um, and exits from it almost never. Um, he stays um, in it. He was a, um, a very pious uh, figure um, whose piety and, and sort of Christ-like attributes very moved the people of Florence. One of the few times he came out, he preached in the piazza in front of Santa Maria Novella and half of the audience burst into tears and sobbed helplessly just seeing uh, this very um, magisteri- magisterial and yet also very humble man uh, preaching to them. So he didn't really take part in the intellectual um, life of the city? No, you could not call him a humanist. Uh, he, he came from a very wealthy Venetian family. Uh, but the first thing he did upon coming into his, his inheritance was donate all of his money to the monasteries in Venice. Um, and ultimately, he then uh, entered the church. Um, and so uh, he wasn't all that interested in, in the, what we could call the new learning, mm. uh, the new Greek and Latin literature that's being studied in Florence and by the 1430s also elsewhere. However, the critical thing, uh, the reason why his arrival in Florence is such a boon to learning is that coming with him, also as refugees fleeing, uh, some of them were even kidnapped on en route because they came overland and held for ransom, were the members of the Curia, the people bureaucracy, uh, the sort of administrative arm of the church, who were some of the best scholars in Italy. They're the greatest Latinists. If you were um, a young man who was a brilliant Latin scholar, but maybe came from very humble beginnings, uh, you wouldn't have a chance of making cardinal, bishop, anything like that, uh, because you didn't have the money and influence. But what you, you know, your brain and your facility with Latin would get you into the curia, and that then would give you a kind of influence um, and and a certain amount of power as well. And so suddenly in 1434, coming in the summer of 1434, we have some of the best minds in Europe. Uh, so, some of which, some of whom are already known in Florence because they're Tuscan and have lived in Florence previously. And presumably, the the growth of um, you know the curia and and ge- administration in general that was an important part of the secularization of learning at this time, wasn't it? Because before then, if you wanted to read, learn to read or write Latin, you really had to be a monk or a priest. But then these new career paths open up for people like Poggio and... Um... Yeah, I mean, if someone knew Latin in, say, 1400, uh, he, and I use the um, male mm. pronoun advisedly, but in the 1400s, uh, there um, were very conspicuous cases of women who cr- could read Latin and Greek, um, a number of them in Florence. But for the most part, um, if you knew Latin around about 1400, uh, you were either a priest or an ecclesiastic of some sort, you were a, um, a, a member of the papal administration, the Curia, or you were a notary um, who worked often for a government. Um, perhaps you were an ambassador or something like that. And so, yes, the there is a kind of uh, trickle down of Latin uh, from the ecclesiastical level where it had been in the Middle Ages to the notaries, scholars, people like that. The most common profession in Florence in the 1400s was not wool worker, which you might think, wasn't mm. even bank manager or something like that. I mean, uh, we know that Florence's wealth came from banking and wool, but the, the guild with the most members enrolled, um, and you couldn't walk 20 feet in Florence without tripping over one of them, was a notary. And all notaries needed to have good handwriting and they needed to know Latin. And so yeah. you've got this wonderful, uh, a kind of perfect storm in some ways of a very literate population in Florence, uh, which is something else that's very interesting to consider. Florence had a literacy rate, um, adult male literacy, probably of around 70 percent. So seven in 10 men could read and write. And how, how did that compare with other places in Italy and Europe to, to give us a bit of context? Paris, um, it's been estimated around 25%. Um, if you go into the countryside, Paris is a larger city. Yeah. I think that would have held true probably um, for somewhere like Milan also, around 25%. Uh, that's the average 25% in cities in the countryside. 
So once you go into the villages, it's anywhere between 1% and 5%, very, yeah. very small. And this is literacy not in Latin. This is literacy um, in, in the yeah. vernacular. Hi, I'm Artemis, one of the presenters on this podcast. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd, one of the world's leading visual historians. His extraordinary photo colorization work has appeared on the covers of National Geographic, Life and People magazines, and he's worked on special projects for titles like The Times of London and NPR. Through his expertly researched and detailed work, Jordan has brought to life some of the most famous events and people from modern history. Whether it's his portrait of Abraham Lincoln or his sweeping panorama of the D-Day beaches in 1944. One of my current favourites is a photograph taken on the 1911 Terra Nova expedition to the Antarctic. The original shot is strange and beautiful, and it shows just how otherworldly parts of our planet can sometimes look. But the image is completely elevated by the deep and icy blues that Jordan's colorization work brings out. This, alongside many others, are available to buy as prints, and they make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past. To find your favourite historical image, have a look at Jordan's site at www.colorgraph.co. Okay, and so the cura arrives and, and the pope arrives in Florence, and as you say, we have this perfect storm. And then I believe in our next scene, our final scene, we're going to meet the man who really was the biggest mover and shaker um, and patron, ultimately, um, in this whole scene. So can you take us, please, to the third scene? Uh, so it's October, the first week of October, 1436, so a couple of months later. Um, and if uh, you arrived in Florence at that time and looked uh, at the streets, you would see no one in the center of Florence because everyone had poured uh, onto the outskirts and in, into the uh, streets outside the north walls uh, because they knew that Cosimo de' Medici was returning to the city. Cosimo had been in exile for exactly a year. He'd spent 52 weeks in exile. Um, he, at this point, was in his mid-40s, and, and he was the wealthiest uh, wealthiest man, in not just in Florence, probably the wealthiest man in Europe, um, head of the Medici Bank, who were papal bankers, um, and had been since 1420. So why was he exiled? Who exiled him and why? Cosmo was exiled because of uh, the factionalism that existed in Florence and that had existed for decades, if not centuries earlier, and would go on for decades and centuries afterwards. Essentially, Florence was run. Florence was a republic in name, but it was run by uh, oligarchs. It was run by powerful families um, who sort of had Republican window dressing, uh, where about a quarter of the population uh, was fran enfranchised and had a kind of vote and say in mm. affairs. But in fact, the machinery of power belonged to just a few people, a few families. L like in Venice, it's very similar to Venice. And in Florence, uh, the families that the family that was really in control in the first uh, few decades of the 1400s were the Albizzi. The leading member of the family in the 1420s and 30s was uh, Rinaldo. Um, and Ronaldo decided he was going to get rid of his, the threat to his power, which was Cosimo, because the Medici were not an ancient family, or at least not a prestigious ancient family. Their roots were in the Mugello, north of Florence. They were country people. They'd migrated into the city, or at least some of them had come into the city in the 1300s. Um, and ultimately, they became moneylenders. But Cosimo's father, Giovanni, ultimately became, opened a bank in Rome in, in the 1390s, and by uh, the second decade of the 1400s became the papal banker to a man who was deposed, one of the three popes who got deposed. But uh, ultimately, he built up tremendous wealth in the family, and Cosimo continued that after Giovanni's death in 1429. So Rinaldo degli Albizzi sees Cosimo quite rightly as a tremendous threat to him and the other families because of the fact that he is going to be able to, with his money and with the influence he holds over his neighborhood around the Church of San Lorenzo, and also with the marriage alliances that he's making with other powerful families, such as the Bardi, another uh, wealthy 
banking family, he's going to outmaneuver the Albizzi. Uh, so Ronaldo decided he would strike first, and he did so in October 1433 when he had Cosimo arrested on a trumped up charge of treason. Cosimo was charged with trying to elevate himself above the lot of an ordinary citizen of Florence. Um, and he was also accused. Which he absolutely was trying to do, no doubt. <laughs> yes, so, so were the Albizzi. I mean, that's what, that's what they were all doing. More seriously, I suppose, he was accused um, of treason uh, and of conspiring with foreign forces to overthrow the government of Florence and install himself. That was a um, confession that was obtained under torture and no one believed it, but they had a signed confession from a friend of Cosimo, a poet. A very, very sadly, this poet was tortured and ultimately after days of torture said, yes, Cosimo is going to try to take over the government. So Cosimo was imprisoned. Um, many foreign powers uh, who needed Cosimo's money um, intervened and said, you know, you do not execute him because the charge, of course, was treason and mm. the punishment was death. Um, and so the Albizzi realized they could not murder Cosimo, although Ronaldo tried to have him poisoned in his cell. But ultimately, Cosimo paid bribes um, and the Signoria, the government of Florence, voted uh, for a, a sentence of exile. And so he was exiled to Padua, first of all, and then ultimately he went after two months to Venice. Um, and he spent the next 10 months there, um, lavishly entertained by the yeah, Venetians. Yeah, he probably had a lovely time. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and he also, and the Venetians did too, because he lavished his wealth on them. He built a, li a library for a monastery and things such as that, all of which stood him in good stead with the Venetians. Ultimately, things began to fall apart in Florence in 1434. The government couldn't raise funds. The Albizzi turned out to be very incompetent and corrupt, as everyone had sort of known. Mm -hmm. And the people began to hearken for Cosimo. They, they wanted his return. Um, and so it's sort of like, I, as I was watching what happened with Alexander Navalny returning to Russia, I was sort yeah. of thinking of Cosimo. It was that sort of thing where, or again, going further back in history, Ayatollah Khomeini going back to Tehran in the late 70s, uh, where someone is coming back and all of the people turn out to greet him. So here we are then, October 1434, with Cosimo coming on the road from Venice uh, to return as a kind of savior of Florence with his wealth and his influence with other foreign powers. He's going to save the Florentines who've been losing wars, losing money, things like that, losing people, the city's being depopulated. And so Flor um, uh, Florence is ready to welcome him. However, on the eve of his, what was going to be his arrival into Florence, the Florentine government, who is sympathetic to him and who has recalled him because Cosimo said he would not return to Florence unless the government called him back. Um, he didn't want it to look like he was carrying out a coup or anything like that. He wanted to have a kind of legal paper saying you have a right to come back into the city. The government, having issued that, then when he arrived at the gates of Florence said, look, wait a bit, wait for nightfall. Don't come in at present. You can see everyone is massing around and we don't know what will happen. They didn't know if the Albizzi were going to attack and if there would be bloodshed. Um, and so what happened is uh, maybe rather like Navalny to go back to him, his flight being diverted to a different airport. Cosimo was diverted to a different gate. He came into a very obscure gate, um, uh, uh, not even a gate, really a door in the wall, very near the Bargello actually. So he would have come in very close to the shop Vespasiano was working in, and he would have come in under the cover of night and gone straight to the Palazzo Vecchio, the, the town hall, and he spent uh, the rest of the evening there. And so Cosimo arrives back at that time. There are still celebrations and everything like that because he's seen as the man who is going to pull Florence out of um, these difficulties that it's been experiencing for the last year and in some ways for the last 10 years or so. And that is exactly what he did, isn't it? Yes. It, I mean, this is the beginning of what, when Vespasiano looks back at the end of his life, when he looks back at those first few decades especially, the 1430s, 40s, and 50s, 
he refers to it as this golden age. Golden age. But what's even more interesting than that in some ways, because Vespasiano is looking back on it, by the 1480s and 90s, he does not think we're in a golden age in Florence. He thinks there's been a decline. But the interesting thing about people writing in Florence in the 1440s, 50s, and 60s is they are talking in the present tense about a golden age. And that's extremely unusual because usually a golden age is something in the past and maybe in the future. Um, it's something that we can create again in the fullness of time. We can recapture the glories of the past in the future. But the Florentines seem genuinely, genuinely to have believed in the middle decades of the 1400s that they were living in this very charmed golden age, which had been created um, through things like the largesse of Cosimo de' Medici, who um, not only funded scholars um, and may well have funded Vespasiano, as I discuss in the book. It's a very interesting relationship between the two of them. They, Vespasiano came to know him very closely, but also, of course, artists. Cosmo was the great patron of artists and architects. So we have growing up in Florence this, a kind, well, we have a kind of critical mass of intellectual and artistic activity where there's a kind of community of minds created in the middle decades under this somewhat um, beneficent rule of Cosimo. Not everyone benefited from his rule, but for the most part, I think people looking back um, after his death regarded him as having steered Florence in the right direction. And it must have been an amazing time to be a scholar and to kind of feel that you really are at the center of something incredible. And, you know, they were right. They, they were, absolutely. They're very interesting that they had that sort of self-awareness that, that this was happening now. And um, as you say, it wasn't something to be looked back on or hoped for in the future. It's definitely a time that, yeah, I would have liked to have gone back to. Wonderful. Um, so now there's just one question left for me to ask you, which I would imagine will be quite difficult for you to answer. Um, there's lots of books for you to choose from, lots of writing scripts. But which artefact would you have picked up from one of those three scenes um, to bring back with you to the present? Well, it, it would be a book. It would be a book that was produced uh, by one of Vespasiano's scribes. So I'll ask for one that uh, would have been burned up in a fire. Um, he did a lot of work for Janus Pannonius, who was one of the great scholars of the century, who was a Hungarian scholar. Um, and his works ultimately went into the uh, library and were burned um, in the 16th century. So I would ask for Cicero's letters to friends that Vespasiano had created for him. Um, so it'd be a very beautiful artifact that would be full of Cicero's gossipy stories of what he had done on any given day um, and who, who he was gossiping about. I think that's a great choice. So it would have been a beautiful thing to look at and also a great read at the same time. Because it would have been not just had very beautiful handwriting, it would have been had, had very beautiful illustrations as well. Yes, and these manuscripts were works of art as well, weren't they? As well as being incredibly important repositories of knowledge. This has been a really, really interesting conversation. Thank you, Ross, so much for coming on. Pleasure. That was me, Violet Muller, chatting to Ross King last week. His stunning book, The Bookseller of Florence, Vespasiano da Bisticci and the Manuscripts that Illuminated the Renaissance, is out now and available from all good bookshops. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>